But evolution doesn't stop there. These species are then themselves honed by the presence of other species. The environment in the form of lions is getting systematically worse from the point of view of a zebra. And from the point of view of a lion, zebras are getting systematically worse. They're getting better at running away. Predators are getting better at catching prey. Prey are getting better at escaping from predators. And so there's a kind of escalation. It's an arms race. Arms races account for the spectacularly advanced engineering of life. Camouflage systems, camera lens eyes, venomous stings. Arms races can be seen in unexpected places. Mankind is certainly not immune to the nightmare Darwin called the War of Nature. We humans are currently in a battle with viruses. It's being fought all around our world. Today, in the slums of Nairobi, natural selection acts through a virulent disease, cutting through the population. Nairobi's prostitutes have, on average, seven to ten clients per day, with a high prevalence of HIV, which causes AIDS. But genetic researchers have found that some lucky individuals have a weapon in the arms race with HIV. Salome? Yeah. How, do you How do? are you? I'm Richard. <laughs> a remarkable resistance to the virus. Can I ask, how, how long have you been a sex worker? Twenty-five years. And during that time, have you lost many friends to AIDS? Mm. I've lost many friends. Many friends. Mm. When did you first discover that you are resistant to HIV? Mm -hmm. Me for a long time, but I, she actually believed completely 1990 that she was a resistant. She feels maybe God has just been good on, to her and she's the lucky one. Yes. It's not God at work here in all this squalor and suffering. And it's not luck either. The Canadian scientist Larry Gelman has studied the odds of survival. We knew the prevalence of HIV in the sex worker population. We knew the prevalence in the clients that they were dealing with. Uh, we knew how often they were having sex with these people. And it was just a mathematical impossibility that they should have been sex workers for as long as they had with the number of the contacts that they had and not become HIV infected. The resistance these women have seems to be a variation that can be passed on to their children. Some of the women are related to each other, familially. Uh, we also think that there's some factor going on in their blood, in their cells, within their cells, uh, that is probably genetically transmitted. I suppose if we came back in 1,000 years, we might expect to see a major shift in the frequency of, the, of these genes in the population. Yes, yeah, so I think in any epidemic situation, those people who are very vulnerable and susceptible are going to get sick and die and those people who are going to survive are going to have some kind of resistance which they're going to transmit onto their descendants. Just as Europeans today are descendants of those who had the genes to survive the plague, so if Africa's AIDS epidemic took its course, natural selection would favor descendants of women with resistance to HIV. This is the unstoppable force of natural selection, first revealed by Darwin, now observed by modern science. Back in England at Down House, now 20 years after his voyage on the Beagle, Darwin had worked out the answers to the biggest questions ever asked. 
but he was strangely reluctant to go public with his idea. Darwin himself said that he'd become a kind of machine for grinding theories out of huge assemblages of facts. I think that wasn't really what it was like at all. He was an extraordinarily imaginative, deep thinker. He had a prodigiously curious mind as well. He was drawn to facts that didn't fit. He once said, I cannot bear to be beaten. Darwin's theory explained how the diversity of life on the planet had evolved spontaneously without interference from any god. But he was acutely aware of how upsetting this flat contradiction of the religious story would be. He hesitated to publish. Then, in June 1858, Darwin received a letter from a naturalist traveling in the Far East, Alfred Russell Wallace, which set out similar ideas. Darwin was in despair about being scooped. He was even ready to drop his life's work. But he was persuaded by Charles Lyell and others to present his unpublished work alongside Wallace's notes and then complete his masterpiece for publication. I've come to meet Randall Keynes, Darwin's great-great-grandson, to try to understand Darwin's frame of mind as he finished his book. This is a book about geology by Mr. Greenough. It has this wonderful inscription, Charles Darwin, Buenos Aires, October <laughs> 1832. So he's on the beagle, yes. really getting into his stride as a geologist. So this is a scrapbook, a children's scrapbook, that belonged to Darwin's daughter, Annie. Darwin was no aggressive polemicist. He didn't take to the stage to publicize his work, but sought to influence leading thinkers behind the scenes by sending them proof copies of the book with apologetic letters attached. He would write things like, this vile rag of a theory of mine. Was that genuine modesty or was there an element of false modesty about it? It was entirely real. Um, and this is a very strange point about him. Through the years when he was stealing himself for publication, um, he was at different times um, enormously confident in it. And then at other times, he was utterly uncertain. He had a deep fear, I think, that one species would be discovered that had some element of its makeup that could only have been designed. Doubts may have lingered in Darwin's mind, but finally, 150 years ago, he set out his ideas on evolution and how it worked in The Origin of Species. The book sold out its first run of 1,250 copies within two days. It has never been out of print since. The origin turned our world upside down. But still, there was one big gap in Darwin's understanding. A hundred and fifty years ago, at the age of fifty, Charles Darwin finally published the big idea he had sat on for almost 20 years, a natural law that explains life itself and the evidence available to him to back it up. This is the most precious book in my collection. It's a genuine first edition, Origin of Species. But it's not just the most precious book in my library. Charles Darwin's Origin of Species is one of the most precious books in the entire library of our species. This book made it possible no longer to feel the necessity to believe in anything supernatural. It completely revolutionized the way we see ourselves, the world, and our origins. <laughs>